You are listening to Off the Shelf, a podcast by The Conference Board. Hello, my name is Robin Erickson, and I'm the Vice President for Human Capital at The Conference Board. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this edition of Off the Shelf, a podcast series brought to you by The Conference Board. You may have heard about the empathetic leadership style and wondered if the focus on empathy was a fad or here to stay. Today, I'm joined by Rob Volpe, the CEO of Ignite360, and the author of Tell Me More About That, Solving the Empathy Crisis, One Conversation at a Time. And his book demystifies empathy and presents five steps that anyone can use to get to empathy when they're interacting with others. Thanks so much for joining us today, Rob. Hi, Robin. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. We're thrilled to have you here, especially as uh, I think empathy is more important now than it has been in a very long time, given everything we've been going through. So my first question to you is, why is empathy so important today, especially when we think about the current geopolitical crisis in the Ukraine and the lingering effects of the two-year global pandemic and all the other crises we've been dealing with in the last couple of years? All the other things that are going on. I think we're, we are experiencing right now the uh end result of years of decline of empathy skills and are, are being empathetic. Um, you know, the muscles have atrophied uh, over time through lots of different reasons um, and, and things that have caused that. But now suddenly we're in, you know, the pandemic um, gave us time to reflect and think and, and ponder who do we want to be as people. And we also were put into white collar work, well, everybody, but white collar workers were put into a challenging situation where suddenly they were working from home and they were still expected to perform. And they also, you know, if they were a parent had to deal with their parents or they had their cats or dogs, you know, running around and they weren't necessarily finding support, empathetic support from their uh, manager, from their organization. And so that created um, a lot of discomfort and, and dislike. And also just when you see so much hate happening, whether you're watching George Floyd get murdered by a police officer, whether you are watching um, the vitriol that's coming out of our political discourse, it, you know, we had no place to go for the last two years. You couldn't avoid, you turn on the TV, you turn on your devices and you'd see this imagery, you'd hear these stories coming up. And now you're looking at Ukraine going on, which is just an act of hatred by one le autocratic leader against a country um, for, for, you know, seemingly no good reason. And it's, we're, we're just at that enough is enough sort of point. And so you're seeing people respond to that with a recognition of, hey, we need to treat each other better. We need to be better. Maybe I'm not liking how I'm showing up in the world. I need to change that. And the way to do that is to be more empathetic in our interactions. So people are leaving companies. The great resignation is going on. And one of the big reasons is fueling that is people not feeling like they were empathetically supported in their, their organization. And, you know, as, as one would say, they're voting, you know, with their feet and taking themselves elsewhere. They've reimagined the life that they want for each other, for themselves, for each other. And if their organization isn't meeting that, then they're, they're choosing to go on. And it's creating a problem. There's so many companies now that are like, what do we do? How do we become empathetic? And it is a, counter to traditional thinking, patriarchal leadership styles that we've just been indoctrinated with for the last 80, 70, 80 years. And one of the great ironies I find about all of that, there's a, a quote from Henry Ford that I often cite from 1918, where, and I'm going to paraphrase it slightly, but he said, the secret of success is to be able to see another person's point of view and to adopt that angle as though it were your own. He's talking about empathy uh, over a hundred years ago. So somehow we lost that, you know, it, it got squeezed out of our leadership style out of the workplace. That wasn't the way we were supposed to be as we continued to focus. We took the productivity lessons from Henry Ford and continued to amp those up, but we didn't take that one humanity lesson and, and modify it. And now it's, it's come back. Completely agree. Um, here at the conference board, we've been doing a lot of research around the increase in burnout 
that employees are feeling and trying to understand what organizations can do, what leaders can do to try to help that. So related to that, then how do you make room for empathy specifically in the workforce? You know, you have a, it starts from the top, ideally like this, the CEO, the senior leaders need to start to, to change their behavior and to model it and to encourage it, if not enforce it. Um, but if you're a leader at any level in an organization, it's about taking the time to listen to people, to not just be focused on the productivity, but to hear what's going on with somebody, to notice, you know, if you're on a Zoom call, like, what, what do I see in the background? Let me ask you a question about that. To find out, check in how somebody's doing, how their day has been. I, I often counsel um Folks, you know, if you've got that one-on-one -on -one stand up check-in, whatever you call it, meeting with your manager and your direct report, of that 30 minutes, take like at least 10 minutes and just talk about life. What are you streaming right now? What's, you know, how's your family doing? Hear what's going on with them. See them as a person. You will get through all the work-related stuff. You'll have time for that, but connect with people on a human level. And you're going to find increased levels of loyalty. Their job performance is going to get better. They're going to feel like they can actually balance. And there's studies um, that support all of this. They're going to be able to, to um, manage their work-life balance a lot better when they have an empathetic leader. Uh, they're able to be more innovative uh, at work. They are more likely to stay. 90% of Gen Z have indicated they will stay at an organization that has empathetic leadership. Um, and yet one in four uh, employees, only one in four employees feel that the empathy in their leadership or in their organization is sufficient. And there's just so much tension there. And so, you know, 4 million plus people every month are leaving their jobs. Correct. And we're actually in the middle of uh, doing the survey for our reimagined workplace two years later. So we the conference board was one of the first organizations to put a survey in the field about how organizations were treating employees after COVID. In fact, our survey was in the field in April and we published the report in May. And as a researcher yourself, you know just how difficult it is to have a survey in the field and then publish within a month. But uh, so that survey is currently in the field and we're looking to publish that next report, hopefully by the end of April and uh, we'll have some more data for you there. But Given the fact that um, I know you are a CEO, you're a very busy person, and given the fact that I know how much goes into research, what prompted you to write this book? So empathy has always been uh, a superpower of mine from the time I was young, growing up in Indiana, I got bullied and teased because we were, my parents had moved into a very small town and we were very other. Um, and so the kids started to, to bully me, but then it really got going in 2010 when the University of Michigan study came out that found that college students starting in 2001 had 40% less empathy than their classmates, or the, the ability to see their peers, to see the point of view of their peers when compared to previous decades. And the study went all the way back to 1979. That was really concerning to me because I was like, okay, this is 2010. If you were in college in 2001, that means you're 30 right now, roughly. That means you're working, you're a leader, you may be married, you're a member of society and a community. And if you have almost half the amount of empathy that people used to have, we're in trouble. And you've seen that continue to play out in the, the ways that we um, interact with each other, discourse, the, the um, polarization of everything, the you know, winner takes all, zero sum game approach to business, to politics, to, to life in general, to our social media interactions. So at Ignite360, we started to look at, because what we do is connect our clients with their consumers, with the humans, that buy their products and their services and listen to their, their marketing campaigns. And if you don't understand how to connect with them, if you can't make that connection, you're never gonna be able to have those winning products. So um, that's where looking at our own behavior, looking at the, the studies that were out there, looking at our clients and the way they were engaging, we identified these five steps to getting to empathy. 
which I was going to ask you about next. Why don't you share those five steps with our audience? Yeah, and so the five steps to empathy, and these are the things you need to do in the moment. It's like, what are the things that get in your way? And they're the things that I get challenged with as well. And I, I use um, the space in the book to you, I share my stories from going out on ethnographic research and the times when I've been challenged uh, by my own judgment or what happens when I ask a good question. And so I use that to bring it to life in an engaging way. And the first step is dismantling your judgment. And for folks that are older or sl uh, more educated, college degree or higher, that tends to be the hardest step to overcome or the, the biggest barrier to overcome. It's like a brick wall. Second step is asking good questions. So it's not asking the leading question. It's not asking just close-ended questions. Those can have their place. But when you're talking to somebody, you want to ask how they're doing, you ask a really broad question. Or you say, um, as a follow-up, tell me more about that. That's the title of the book. That's why it's the title of the book. It's tell me more. It, it, it opens it up so that the um, person you're speaking with can give you whatever is in their, their mind, their heart, whatever their story is. They can share without you zeroing them in on one particular angle that might affirm your own biases. You can go down that road later, but first you need to explore. And then you need to actively listen. And it's not just hearing the words, it's looking at the body language, reading the nonverbal cues, picking up on what's going on around that individual. If you're on a Zoom call and you've got an employee that's got a kid doing cartwheels behind them in the background, there's probably something else happening for them that you might want to unpack and spend a few minutes, like I was saying, take the time to talk to somebody and listen and hear what's going on for them and what's real. So you're using all of your other senses, and I believe you use your intuition in this space as well. And, and we humans, for whatever reason, choose to ignore our intuition. We walk down the dark alley, um, even though the hairs are standing up on the back of our, our necks. We need to use our intuition and trust our guts more. And that's part of active listening. The next one is then integrating into your understanding. Um, and this is where, and judgment starts to, to come up here as well. This is about making room in your head that there are other ways to see the world. And an example I give of this is, you know, my favorite flavor of ice cream is chocolate. Robin, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Chocolate. Okay, so we're going to see eye to eye on this, but if somebody else comes in and says they like vanilla, instead of us going, ew, why do you like vanilla? What is it so plain? It's so boring. It's boring. So boring. <laughs> exactly. However, um, when you ask somebody what it is that they like about vanilla, they'll actually, they may give you information about their point of view that changes the way you, you see vanilla. And you know they might talk about the floral notes of it or the, the beauty of the simplicity of vanilla and the sort of comfort that it might provide or that they love to put toppings on their ice cream and vanilla is like the perfect carrier for that. And so why is that important? Well, if you and I are working at a company and you know we're, have to, we're tasked with creating a new product and we recognize, ooh, vanilla is actually a popular flavor, we need to do something, our inclination is going to be our bias is to put chocolate on it because we love chocolate and there's no such thing as too much chocolate. However, that's not going to appeal to somebody that likes vanilla. And so by having empathy, by integrating into our understanding that point of view, we're then able to create the winning product that uses vanilla. And you can take that and apply it in any number of situations and categories. And then the final step is using solution imagination. And so that is in the moment you're starting to imagine what would it be like to be a, that other person? What is the thing that's going to, um, you know, how might they be feeling? How might they have been reacting? And then you can ask questions about it or you can reflect it. The challenge I give to people is to be able to say, and how do you know when you're being empathetic, is if you can say back to somebody, I can imagine that must have felt like, and state and repeat back what they were saying, or I can see your point of view. So imagine you're at work and you're having a conversation and someone has a conflicting point of view, but you might say, okay, I can see your point of view. You feel X, or you're thinking X, Y, Z. I hear that, here's where I'm coming from. And so by both sharing your point of view, you're able to then, and you know, that's empathy, 
then you're able to reach consensus, collaboration, persuasion, decision, like all the things that, that empathy enables. Very, very interesting. And I think those are all good advice. Um, at the very beginning, you said, though, that dismantling judgment was the hardest for people who are most like us in the workplace, right? The people who are listening to podcasts, the ones who are, you know, doing that while they're exercising or they're driving to work. Um, is that actually the hardest of the five steps? From the data that we collected uh, most recently in January, um, it, it was actually, it was really interesting. I was expect, my, my bias was that, oh yeah, it was gonna be 70% of people were gonna say judgment is the hardest thing. <laughs> and we asked like, you know, rank these, these effectively the steps, we phrase them differently, but um, rank these things, you know, easiest to hardest and, um, there was a lot of polarization, like so much so that we're still kind of sifting through and looking at the different variations. Um, you know, men had more difficulty with listening than women did. Total stereotype, but men were not as, as good at actively listening as, as women might be. Um, younger individuals were indicating they had more difficulty listening um, and then knowing what the question what to ask for millennials and, and Gen X. But as we continue to cut the data and we had a sample size of about a thousand so we could go relatively deep among American adults. When it got into education level judgment was the thing if you had a college degree or postgraduate degree judgment was the hardest step um, for you and in overall. Uh, judgment eked out over uh, actually the imagination pieces uh, as being the most challenging for people. That, that actually makes sense to me, Rob, just from the consideration that most leaders are required to make judgments all the time. Like that's part of their job description, right? They, yeah. they have to make decisions and they have to make them fast. And especially when you think about pilots who have the lives of hundreds of people in their hands or surgeons who might have the life of just one person in their hands. But, but that's part of the job description is to make decisions quickly. Yeah, it absolutely is. And, and this is some of the, the things that I try to demystify about empathy as well. People are afraid of empathy because they think, A, it's all about emotion. And it's not. It's, there's two types of empathy. Generally, there's cognitive empathy. That's the perspective taking. And then there's emotional empathy. And the emotional empathy is the, the feeling part of it. Cognitive empathy is what we need and use in our day-to-day -day life and our interactions with people that are other. And then within judgment, as you were just talking, all of those, those examples you were giving, yeah, leaders need to make judgments. What they don't need to do is be judgmental. So judgment has two sides to it. Making a judgment, that's all the decision-making. And absolutely, I want people to make judgment calls. Being judgmental, casting aspersion on somebody because they like vanilla ice cream, you know, and so oh, you're plain, you're boring, as, as Anna Delvey would say, you're so basic. Um, those are the things that we don't have room for, and that's what gets in the way of empathy. That's that puts the blinders on us. I really like your definition of that. Um, we could keep talking about this for a long time. Um, I'm aware of the time, so let me ask you one more question sure. that I think is particularly relevant, which is. What does empathy look like in a remote work situation? Yeah, empathy and, and Ignite360 has been virtual from day one when I founded the company in 2011. So we, we've been doing this for a while. Um, and it is about taking the time to connect and making space for people to, to be human with each other. Um, you know, we have... One example, we have a coffee talk that we host every two weeks. It's virtual. It's not about work. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about work, but it is not you know, work focused. We'll find other topics. We'll talk about current events. Um, it was really helpful as the riots were starting right after George Floyd's murder. It gave us a chance to come together and just, you know, and I have a lot of colleagues based in Minneapolis in particular, and they were very upset as they should be. And it gave us a chance to just go, oh my God, what's happening? Um, so it's it's making time for those human moments and supporting each other, asking how people are doing, but also then in your day-to-day -day interactions, reflecting empathy back. So being able to say, I can see where you're coming from and repeating you know, where, where you think that person is coming from and even affirming with them 
did I get that right? Is that actually your your point of view, Robin, on on something? Because that you you have to be more thoughtful. You have to be a little bit more precise and deliberate when you're interacting virtually to make sure people are understanding. You know, because you can't always read the body language as much. So the more you can do to mirror back what somebody's saying, to use empathetic language around work topics as well as the personal human topics the better everybody's going to be. I love your idea of having to make the time to, to have those personal connections and having worked remotely for a long time. Um, I do think that, you know, in as much as we're all sort of zoomed out, if we don't make that time to get to know each other and to, as humans, it's really hard to do our work as effectively. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking me about it. Any final thoughts that you want to, leave our audience with? Yeah, um, Maya Angelou had an amazing quote once where she said she believed that we all had the ability to be empathetic uh, or to have empathy, but we may not have the courage to display it. And so what I challenge, always challenge everyone with is be courageous. You can do this. We have the capacity to be empathetic. We just have to be courageous to step forward and do it. Well, I love that quote. I love the fact that you shared it and really enjoyed your book. Uh, thank you again for joining us today and for all of your insights. For our listeners, I'd like to thank you for joining us today as well. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast and have a better idea of how to improve your skills around empathy. If you'd like to find out more about our research and other interactive programs, please visit our website at tcb.org slash podcasts or slash webcasts. You can also find our podcasts on other platforms like iTunes or Spotify. Thanks again and have a wonderful day. This has been Off the Shelf, a podcast by The Conference Board.